indeed for you in the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a beautiful example to emulate to follow he was an orphan if allah wanted allah didn't need to make him an orphan but it's in order for us to aim high whether you are an orphan whether you've lost your mother your father your child or anyone else must not deter you from achieving your goal you will still earn the pleasure of allah you can succeed in this world and the next assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most gracious most merciful alhamdulillah all praise is indeed due to Allah the creator the nourisher cherisher sustainer provider protector curer wa usalli wa usallim ala afdhal al khalqi ajma'in nabiyyina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'in wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yawmiddin Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his entire household all his companions may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless every single one of us may Allah bless our offspring those to come up to the end may Allah keep them steadfast and keep every single one of us steadfast as well my brothers and sisters alhamdulillah we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for gathering us here with the purpose of gaining closeness to him i'm sure every single one of us here is being inspired would like to be inspired or has just been inspired it's not enough to achieve inspiration and do nothing about it it is said that within the first few hours of having listened to a talk that is powerful if you don't act on it perhaps the intention or the strength of wanting to act on it begins to diminish such that within 48 hours it disappears completely so if your life has to change it has to change while you are listening to the talk it has to change as you are seated do not say i will change as soon as i leave i will go home and from tomorrow morning i'm going to start again not at all right here right now is where decisions have to be made remember this when we shoot for the moon we will never be able to get to the moon we will never be able to go close to the moon if we do not have a plan of action if we are not serious about it people say i'd like to achieve what would you like to achieve when you are sleeping every day you've made no resolutions take a look at the kuffar every year when the year is ending they openly pronounce their resolutions these are my new year resolutions and a lot of them have some decent resolutions regarding giving up bad habits quitting smoking quitting this and that working hard in order to earn trying to get this and get that so many different things with us as muslimin we are not meant to wait for the year to end in order to make a resolution rather allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to us messages through various means and these messages are meant for our ears i'm sure you may have heard of a hadith where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says ma asabaka lam yakul li yukhti'ak wa ma akhta'aka lam yakul li yusibak that which got to you was never meant to miss you and that which missed you was never meant to get to you subhanallah from this people understand okay if someone shoots a gun in your direction and the bullet happens to was passed your ear it was never meant to get to you yes that's included in the hadith they could have tried but it was never meant for you but what's included in it is something else it's regarding every aspect of your life when you hear a message it was meant for your ears this is why my brothers and sisters would you confirm that we hear messages sometimes as though the speaker knows us personally do you agree as though he is addressing a problem that's in my own home like someone went to him and told him you know what this is what i'm going through please talk about it nobody told him anything he doesn't know you he doesn't know your problem it is an inspiration from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant for your ears your situation when people speak about divorce and you're about to go through it when people speak about children and you have the crisis when people speak about financial issues and you are going through one when people speak about medical problems and you have one don't think for a moment they know you they are spying on you they are prying on you no it's allah who knows absolutely everything he made them say it because he wants to give you a sign of hope he wants to give you that light or the ray of hope so that you can turn to him and you need to take it seriously 
Don't take it lightly. Remember this, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say shoot for the moon, you need to be aiming very, very high. Take a look at the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are so many examples. Once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met a certain Bedouin man as he was returning from a journey. And the Bedouin man happened to be hospitable towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he left sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told the Bedouin, visit us as well, meaning visit us in Medina as well. So when the Bedouin visited the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he returned the hospitality with goodness. And then he asked him, he says, ask me, what, what would you like? Who is, uh, who is saying this? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asking the Bedouin to ask him whatever he wants. And he started, because this man was not so knowledgeable, he started asking material items regarding conveyance, regarding shoes, regarding a home, and so on. And when you look at another example of those with knowledge, take a look at Rabi'at ibn Ka'ab, radiallahu an. He was a young boy at the time when he served Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to cut the long story short, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, sell me, ask me, what do you want? Tell me what you want. <laughs> Amazing. What do you think he said? Today, if I were to tell you, what do you want? A few moments ago, I was with some people and one of them said, my aim is within two years, I want to own a Ferrari. And I happen to say, subhanAllah, with all respect, obviously everyone has an aim, at least it's an aim. I happen to say, you know what? You may want to change that over time. It may change. You may not have the Ferrari. I know of people who own Ferraris and Bugattis and Lamborghinis and they get fed up and tired. For them, it's nothing. You can't even drive the car. It's not practical. You've only clocked 90 kilometers on it. And each time you drove it, you had 2,000 ringgit fine minimum because of speeding. Subhanallah. So they then tell you, I didn't think you really want to drive it. You rather go and test drive one or pay in order to take one for a ride. And that's enough for you. You know, like they say, Nowadays, with the social media and Instagram and everything else, you have people who've gone on holiday, they are considered not having gone on holiday if they haven't taken photographs. And those who have not gone on holiday, they are considered holiday makers for as long as they have photographs, even if they're photoshopped. So there are people who show you, we are in Langkawi, we are here, we are in Penang, and they're just at home. <laughs> they have a background and that's it, taking photos, that's it. Let's not fool ourselves, my brothers and sisters. Let's understand we need to live the real life. When you aim, aim high. So this young man, the Prophet sallallahu says, ask me. He says, Ya Rasulullah, as'aluka murafaqataka fil jannah. All I want, and this is a young boy, Rabi'at ibn Ka'b radiallahu an. All I want is to be in your company in paradise. That's it. So the Prophet sallallahu looks at him and says, is there anything else? You know, was there, is there something else perhaps? You know, maybe you're just asking. He says, no, that's it. I just want your company in paradise. Now that is such a smart way of putting it because you're going to be in the highest level of Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ is not someone ordinary. He's not an ordinary person. He's the Nabi of Allah. He's the best of creation. He is the highest of the lot. He will be the highest rank in Jannah. Subhanallah. So the Prophet Sallallahu told him something that I want to share with you and seriously share with you today. He says, help me or help yourself to achieve that or help me to help you to achieve that by finding yourself in prostration very often which means fulfill your salah. If you really want paradise, make sure you fulfill your five daily prayers. Make sure you have the position of sujood, the position of prostration. Make sure you are in it very, very often. Then you will get what you've just asked for. He didn't just say, okay, you will have it. He showed him the way and you need to be serious about it. I cannot say I want to achieve this and I'm busy sleeping at home. I cannot say I want a job and I haven't looked for it. I cannot say I want a promotion and I haven't worked hard. I cannot say I want to study and I've done nothing about it. I cannot say I want to speak the Arabic language. Someone yesterday told me my wish 
is to speak the Arabic language. I said, my brother, stop wishing and start doing something about it. That's a mu'min. That's a true believer. How long am I going to continue saying my wish is to learn the Arabic language? Keep wishing. We wish for things that we don't have and we keep on wishing until the day we die. Do something about it. Get up, go and search, ask people, get the course. It might be online, it might be in your neighborhood. You don't know. So many things are happening in this beautiful country of yours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless us all. Do something about it. This is why the Prophet says, you want Jannah with me? Do something about it. What is it? Salah, don't miss. And if your Salah is not missed, the rest of your deen will be solidified as time passes. If you are serious with your prayer, everything else will solidify. So I want to ask you the question today. What is it that you are aiming for as a believer? The true answer should be? The true answer should be? Jannah. I hope everyone said it. Paradise. That's what we want. In this world, we will struggle. In this world, we will go through lots of difficulty. We spoke about it yesterday. Many of the other speakers spoke about the same. But we need to realize, if you want paradise, there is a way of getting it. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ala inna sil'at Allahi ghaliyah. Behold, the commodity of Allah is expensive. What is the commodity? It is Jannah. And I've always given an example of a person who's bought a house, higher purchase or mortgage. They are paying on a monthly basis installments. When you miss one payment, what happens? You might be fined. You miss two or three payments, you can lose the house. Even if you've paid for two, three years or five years or 10 years, you miss a few payments, there is a possibility of you losing the house. What happens with Jannah? Every Salah is a payment. It is a payment for a house that is far more valuable than these houses in Damansara. It's a reality. It is a serious payment. Every time you miss a Salah, default. Every time you miss one prayer, you're losing out on your house. And if you miss more, you might lose that house completely. This is why if you have aspirations, you are a person who wants to achieve the utmost, and that is paradise. You need to get up and do something about it. Make a payment. What is the payment? When there is a sin that is to be committed, you stay away and you say, Oh Allah, this is because I want Jannah. I will please you. I know there are so many things that I would be able to do on earth that would displease you. I won't do it because my aim is to please you, Oh Allah, so that you can be pleased with me. Have you heard the verse of the Quran where Allah describes some of the companions and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه وأعد لهم جنات. Allah is pleased upon them. They are pleased with Allah, and Allah has prepared for them paradise. To be pleased with Allah and for Him to be pleased with you is something unique. That is when you will definitely achieve paradise. But to be able to earn the pleasure of Allah, you need to pay. Pay in what way? Abstain from prohibitions that He has told you. And engage in that which is compulsory, obligatory upon you. And on top of that, start fulfilling acts that are not compulsory, but they would earn the pleasure of Allah. So a lot of us, mashallah, we fulfill our five daily prayers. Alhamdulillah. But it's just the farad. We are quick to start, quick to end, and we are gone. Farad. That's it. Why don't you increase it? Because I want to earn the pleasure of Allah. Start reading your sunnah. Start reading your nafil. Take your time about things. Make wudu correctly. This is called aiming high. But the problem is sometimes we don't think of where we're going. If you sit and pause for a moment and ponder over your own life and your age and the fact that you are becoming older and you witness the others who have already gone forth to the hereafter, you will realize I need to prepare before I go. More for the hereafter than I am for the rest of this life. Even in this world, if you'd like to achieve things, material items, like I said moments ago, you cannot sit unemployed and continue to beg. When the Prophet ﷺ was faced with a man who said, I don't have anything, I don't have anything. 
in my house. Absolutely nothing. He had a small commodity. The Prophet ﷺ says, bring it. And he sold it for two dirhams. And at the same time, he bought his food with one and with the other one, the Prophet ﷺ said, buy an axe. He bought an axe. And the Prophet ﷺ says, right now, go and work with it and come back. Let's see what you bring forth. He came back in the evening with two dirhams. Then the Prophet ﷺ made a dua for him and told him, go away for 15 days and come back. Go and work hard with this axe. You don't need a qualification to work with an axe. You don't say, I don't know how to use the axe. I don't have a PhD. No. You know, everyone knows the axe. You, you get used to it over time. He came back 15 days later with 30 dirhams. Wow. He now had money. But there was a time when he was begging. He was asking. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Wallahi, it is better for you. It is better for you to work hard and earn money through your perspiration than to ask, than to seek. Don't go and ask. Allah, you are healthy. May Allah protect us. Take a look at Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu an. He came to Medina Munawwara at the time of the Hijrah. He was a wealthy man in Mecca. He lost everything and he came with nothing. And he was told, okay, you know what? I will give you my half of my wealth and I will give you so and so and I will help you with this much and that much. He says, may Allah grant you barakah. Just show me where is the marketplace. Look at this. He's doing something about it. He was aiming very high. Not only in the deen, but even in this worldly life. He went out to the marketplace and his deal was successful. Few days later, he got married. Subhanallah. And marriage at the time was no big deal. The problem we have today, we make such a big deal of it that subhanallah, if we are left out and not invited, we will stop talking to people. You didn't invite me to the wedding. Khalas, these people didn't invite me to the wedding. What is it? They wanted a simple wedding. They only had 20, 50 people. So what? You were not from among them. Make dua for them. The Prophet ﷺ was not invited to the wedding of Abdurrahman ibn Auf, who's one of the ten who, was, who were granted or told, you are in paradise. He was not invited. So when the Prophet ﷺ saw a yellow mark on his clothing, that yellow mark, according to some narrations, was a mark of perfume. And it's a luxury. He, he had known, obviously, that this man perhaps has got married. He says, oh, Abdurrahman, what's this yellow mark on your clothing? He says, oh, messenger, I got married. If it was us, we would say, I'm not talking to you ever again. How could you have got married? We're so close, we're friends, you didn't tell me, you didn't invite me. No, no, no. These people were not petty. They were not small-minded. They aimed very high. Their aim in life was not to be invited to weddings. <laughs> That's not what it was all about. Their aim in life was not to show off things. Their aim in life was not these little minor items that put a smile on the face for five minutes and after that you're depressed again. No, they aimed very high. They aimed to please Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Oh, Abdurrahman, have you had a party? Have you invited people for something known as a walima? And when we say the word walima for us, it's like you need to invite 300 people, walima, minimum. You need to invite 700 people and you need to actually have a big hall and everyone needs to wear a uniform and we need to order clothing six months in advance and get the sizes of the sisters and everyone who's going to come as bridesmaid and maids and they complain because the day of the wedding they've already gained two, three kilos. Doesn't fit them anymore. Or they've lost two, three kilos and it doesn't fit them anymore. And those are disasters, one upon the other. People are upset. People are angry. A small thing goes wrong and the world comes to an end. It was such a happy occasion, spoiled because of one or two items. For us, that's what a walima is all about. Someone desperately couldn't make it and we don't talk to them. I invited you, you didn't come. That's it. I don't want, these people are against me. Something goes wrong in your marriage. I think it was them because they didn't even come to the wedding. They were upset. That's how small-minded we are. That is how petty we've become. And the deen is much higher. You are aiming for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. You're not aiming for little items in this world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, I have not yet, meaning Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu says, I have not done anything yet. He says, awlim walaw bishah. He says, have a little gathering of food for perhaps your close family and friends, even if it means by sacrificing or with one sheep, one. 
It's enough. Call a few people and have it. So it happened. He called a few people and he had it. And he worked so hard that in no time, he was known as one of the richest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. One of the wealthiest. Do you know what? He did not earn his wealth by leaving out his salah. He did not earn his wealth by saying, you know, I am at work, but I can't read my salah because I'm going to lose my job or my boss doesn't agree. Your boss is Allah. If you're aiming for Jannah, your boss is Allah. You will go and do something about it in a nice way. You will speak to them. You will convince them. You will work so hard that they will allow you time off. Recently, I was given an example of a sister who works somewhere. She says, initially, when I started my job, they were a little bit hostile because of my hijab. And I worked so hard in no time, I started doing better than a lot of the other workmates of mine that my boss told me, when it's time for prayer, don't forget to go and pray. And my boss reminds me to go and pray. Subhanallah. Starting from one point, getting to another. Because hard work, you're doing something. You're not lazy. You don't just sit back. We have a new generation of young people, boys and girls. What do they do? They sit back and relax. They want to become wealthy in five minutes. I promise you. And they're playing games. Games. You know, the first time I saw someone a few years ago playing with this Nintendo Wii. Have you heard it? And I see them fisting the air. And I'm like, what's going on? And I said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. I actually told a brother of mine, I think this person needs a bit of help. They need a little bit of assistance. Look, they're going crazy. You know, I can't describe what they were doing, but they were holding something in their hand and they're just hitting the air, you know, and, I'm, and jumping this way and that way. And I'm like, what's going on? There's a TV screen and you like sort of in front of the TV screen and you like hitting the air here. And that person wants to become a doctor. Doctor of what? You know, we. It could mean we. And it could also mean we. Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive us. It depends what you do all your life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our children and ourselves as well. Yes, there is a time to play, but you need to have limitations. You need to know when to stop. You need to know how much it is. Your phone, for example, today is the biggest distraction ever. Did you know that? People were arguing to say, no, it's a ni'mah of Allah. Yes, it's a ni'mah of Allah. We don't debate that. What we are debating is how it's being used. The majority of people, and I'd like to take the liberty in saying this, the majority of people are using it without the discipline that is required when using it. And that's probably a respectful way of wording it. Your phone is a gift of Allah. Your WhatsApp, your WeChat, your Blackberry, whatever messenger, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram. There are so many other platforms, Snapchat and what have you. Yes, it's a ni'mah. But the bulk of us need to be disciplined in that regard. Set yourself a time. I sit and I think, I thank Allah that I've seen the years when there was no internet, no mobile phones. I'm sure a lot of us may have, right? And I've forgotten how it felt. I have literally forgotten what life was like when they had to when I was young, they used to do this, but I've forgotten. I, I, I don't know how it feels anymore. When they had to place a call with the operator in order to call the city next to your city. So you had to dial the operator and you had to say, this is my number, this is who I am, and I'd like to place a call. This is the number, this is the person I'd like to speak to. They will tell you, we will call you back. And how excited you would get when one hour later, krr, krr, that was the default ring. That's how it used to go. Do you remember? Now you've got everything else, subhanallah. You know, all sorts of ringtones, so embarrassing sometimes in the masjid. You know, the most embarrassing thing was, we were sitting in the house of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it was a Jum'ah, and the Imam was speaking about uh, something, okay, something important. And the next thing, a song from the church was literally playing full volume in the masjid and it was in from the first saf so it was close to the imam so the microphone caught the song and it was terrible because the imam had to stop and he said please turn off your phone and then he changed his topic and he started speaking about mobile phones 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, really. I, I feel sorry for that brother because I have had instances where people's phones have rung in salah and I deal with it a little bit differently because for me, I believe that those who are true believers, when something embarrassing happens in prayer, that itself is enough for them to learn a lesson. I don't need to talk about it. I don't need to turn back after salah and the whole masjid turns and embarrasses one person. I remember once the phone rang and we were, I was at the back. We had arrived a little bit late and we had joined salah in the first rakah and we had finished salah with everyone else but arrived a little bit late and I was sitting at the back and the, someone's phone had rung in one of the rakaat and as soon as salah finished because this phone was an irritation everybody turned back to look and I knew whose phone rang but the irony is he turned back as well <laughs> so what could I do I had to turn back as well <laughs> because they're looking at me now but this is how intelligent the young people have become. <laughs> Imagine your phone is ringing. You're so embarrassed. The whole masjid is looking at you and you casually just turn around and look at somebody else. <laughs> how excited we used to get many years back when they say, is this, this, this number? Did you place a call for this? Okay, hold on. Your call is connected. And they say, hello. And we'd say, hello. And we'd get so excited. I don't know if you recall, right? I think a lot of you do. That those were the days when we used to sit at home and we had higher aspirations than we do today. Did you know that? Much higher aspiration. Today, a lot of people's aspiration is to have the latest mobile phone as soon as it comes out. Otherwise, that's it. Wallahi, a lot of the sisters out here and the brothers, a lot of our aspiration is following the trends of clothing. The minute the latest is coming out, I must have it. If I don't, there's a problem. That's your aspiration. And you know, that type of aspiration, you will never ever be quenched, impossible. Because Allah has created this world in such a way that it runs. And anyone who runs behind it, it will always run faster than them. You can have the iPhone 6 today, tomorrow morning there will be a 7. You can have the 7, the next day there will be an 8. You can have the 8 and they will decide it's no longer Galaxy. We are now changing the name to Orbit. That's it. I promise you. And then you want that and you want, and even if you have the best and the latest, you will still want it because those aspirations are so shallow. So change it. It must not be the latest trends that you are following. Wallahi. It must be the pleasure of Allah. You will be content even with your galaxy 2. You know the S2? You'll be happy with it. You'll say, no, this is an old faithful. I like it. It's done nothing wrong to me. May Allah forgive us. But let's take a look at our own aspirations. And I gave you one example because it's a reality. People have always told me you talk a little bit too much about the mobile phone. And I said, I know why I do that. Because every one of us has a mobile phone. I want you to put up your hands if you do not have a mobile phone. Put up your hand very high. You don't have and you don't use one at all. I can only see two or three hands. And that also perhaps your dad must have prohibited it. <laughs> Mashallah, brilliant. Wallahi. And I'm sure these people have higher aspirations. They are aiming for something much higher. With us, subhanallah, it's about accessories, it's about perfumes, it's about shoes, it's about people looking and being wowed by what you look like. Wallahi, that's what it is. We've watched the material world taking over so badly that we've lost the plot. We don't know where to aim. We look at people on the television and we aim that way. And I've always said, stop aiming to be like the girl on the television because the girl on the television herself is not even like the same girl on the television in real life. Really. They're just acting. And life is not an act, to be honest with you. Life is real. It comes to an end. It comes to an abrupt end. And then what happens? You can't meet the angel of death and say, hang on, hang on. I need to quickly WhatsApp. Hang on, hang on. I have the latest phone. Subhanallah. Some of us, when we are going on holiday, we've stopped asking whether there's halal food, whether there's a masjid, whether there's muslimin. We've stopped searching for, you know, brothers and sisters in faith. The destination we're going, is there Wi-Fi? That's the only question. If there is internet, Wi-Fi, that's it. The best holiday ever. Before we used to sit on the beach and admire the qudra and the power of Allah and the beauty across the oceans. Today we are sitting there and like I said, 
We are just on WhatsApp and we are on our chats. What was the point of flying all the way there, wasting your money when you are going to sit here on your phone throughout? When you go on the holiday, leave the phone. Subhanallah. See, no one even said anything. Silence. <laughs> Dead silence. What did he just say? Is he crazy? You have to aim high. You have to please Allah. Your salah, your zakah, your ibadah. And even regarding worldly items, you want to make use of the phone and various other things. You want to have a car and a house. You want to assist your children perhaps so that the next generation will be able to live a little bit more comfortably. You know, when we work hard and we earn money, we've bought a house, we want to earn more money so we can buy houses for our children. Do you agree? Yes. Why do we want to buy houses for our children? Can I tell you why? Because by right, a mu'min and a believer is supposed to think that if I facilitate that much for my child, perhaps they will be able to have more time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps they will be able to use the time to learn the deen, to put it into practice, so I will get a reward. A lot of people whose belief is weak have stopped thinking that way. They've become so material, they don't even know the intention. Why is it that I am looking for my children to have a house before even I die, when I only manage to afford a house 30 years after I got my first job because things have changed everything has come upside down we don't even know so the son the daughter sometimes they have the houses mashallah they are still not happy they're still lacking contentment some of them are lazy they don't have jobs they have to sell the house because of their debts Sometimes we leave a large amount of money. They are fighting because they want to get the largest share of that wealth. We are gone. So what was your aim? What did you leave behind? What will you leave behind the day you go? That's one question. But the more important question is, what will you take with you the day you go? A lot of us say, mashallah, this guy was such a good guy. You know, he passed away. He was a millionaire. He set up all his children. He was so good. No one actually thinks about what did he take with him. A man who was wealthy and spent his wealth in the cause of Allah is the one who took it all with him. When you have spent something, it's written next to your name. The minute you've left it, it now belongs to someone else, not your name, their name. You do a deed and continue doing deeds. You know Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhanallah, if you take a look at how it started at the age of 40 with revelation that came in in the cave of Hira and Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam came with the words Iqra to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that time what happened? He was a man who was known as a person who was an orphan at the beginning. He grew up. The people knew him as truthful and honest. He didn't have that authority and clout of Makkah from a political perspective. But look, over a period of 23 years, everything changed completely and totally. He was not only the political leader, the religious leader, the spiritual leader, the messenger, the most loved of Allah, the one who brought the goodness to the people. But it was so high that that message got through to entire mankind and to the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that wallahi today we are seated here. Where was that? One might argue that okay that was prophethood. It was definitely prophethood but Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Indeed for you in the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a beautiful example to emulate, to follow. He was an orphan. If Allah wanted, Allah didn't need to make him an orphan. But it's in order for us to aim high. Whether you are an orphan, whether you've lost your mother, your father, your child, or anyone else must not deter you from achieving your goal. You will still earn the pleasure of Allah. You can succeed in this world and the next. There are people who've succeeded, yet they have suffered much more than you and I have in this world. And they have achieved much more than you and I have, both in this world as well as the next. Don't become despondent. Don't become a person who loses hope so easily. Yesterday I spoke about how important it is to have hope in Allah. How important it is to be able to feel within you that Allah's forgiven you. You are genuine in asking Allah's forgiveness. So Allah forgave you. 
Don't let your sin bog you down. But remember, my brothers and sisters, we aim for paradise. We aim for Jannah. That is the ultimate goal. And we need to work towards it each time there is a sin to be committed and you abstain from it. Tell yourself and tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I did this for you. You prohibited this. That is why I didn't do it. It's because you prohibited it that I didn't do it. Subhanallah. My brothers and sisters, if you would like to achieve the greatest inspiration ever, it's important to go through the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The greatest of creation. The greatest of creation. There is nothing that you would be able to have in terms of an example better than that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His statements, his words, they are, they are considered sacred in the sense that Allah says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He does not utter words from his own whims and fancies, from his desires. It is indeed revelation revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why it's recorded as hadith. Hadith meaning anything uttered by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anything he did, even the movements, the acknowledgements, the way he walked, the way he talked, how he lived his life, everything is considered part and parcel of the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is recorded for you and I to follow. Take a look at the wealthiest of the wealthy at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and slightly after that. They aimed very high. They knew. They sacrificed their wealth, their time, and they were so knowledgeable. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu Initially, when he began to ask questions, they were, some of the people, some of the people asked him, what is it? Why are you asking so many questions when Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhumah, they are in our presence? People will ask them, they will get the answers. He continued, such that he became known as one of the greatest of the knowledgeable from the Sahaba of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa At the time of Hajj, he used to have such a huge group of people asking him questions, learning from him. He used to do the tafsir. He used to teach rules and regulations. But he was just a young boy. But he aimed very high. One very important reminder. When you aim high, do not be impatient. It is a struggle of a lifetime. You want to learn. Learning, the process continues up to death. It doesn't stop. If you want to learn, the process continues up to death. It doesn't stop. Subhanallah. So don't think I want to learn and five minutes later, ten minutes later, you think you're a knowledgeable person just because you heard one lecture, just because you attended a motivational talk. That's not what it's all about. You will have to struggle, put an effort. People say, I want to learn more about the deen. Well, firstly, you have to search for it. Secondly, you have to register. Thirdly, you will have to spend your time, your money, your effort, your energy. Subhanallah. There are a lot of people whom if Justin Bieber was to come here to KL, they wouldn't mind paying a thousand ringgates. They wouldn't mind paying 10,000 ringgates. They wouldn't mind borrowing money in order to have a seat somewhere nearby. And sometimes, Muslimin, subhanallah. I remember in one country, and I won't mention it because I don't want to poke. But at the same time, I remember in one country, one of these actors was coming through, and they say all the VIP tables were paid off by Muslimin, by Muslimin. The same Muslims whom when there's something religious happening and in order to cover costs, there is an expense and that is shared among the people, they are the first to complain. How can you charge 30 ringgates, 100 ringgates? Why, how can you do this? But brother, you are ready to pay a thousand for someone else who's going to take you in another materialistic direction, the direction that is heading in towards the left, for example. This one is taking you straight to Jannah. Shaitan will come to you. That's his job. What's Shaitan's job? He has a job and he is very, very focused. Remember this. A lot of us lose our own focus. Shaitan never loses focus. He knows what he wants. When it's time for salah, he has to distract you. When it's time for something good, he will make you complain. He will make you have thoughts. He will make things come to your mind. He will make you find fault with people. Someone is speaking solid facts from the Quran and the Sunnah. Shaitan will come to you and make you think in your heart, you know what? 
this guy, I don't want to listen to him because he doesn't do whatever I do in terms of what came down through my forefathers to me. And that's, I've been doing it for years on end. The man is speaking to you from what Allah said, from what the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, change your life. Lend him an ear. Listen, some people are too scared to listen. They don't want to listen. They say, no, no, no. If I listen to this, I'm going to have to change my life. Listen to it. Wallahi, it is a message that Allah intended for you. Subhanallah. Allah will ask you about it. My word, I sent it down for you. Why didn't you read it? Why didn't you try to understand the word of Allah? You would never be fooled by people of the globe. Only if you understood the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, people are making a mockery of religion. You know why? We haven't even aimed to understand the word of Allah. What aspirations do we have? We haven't even aimed to understand the Quran. And so, whatever we do sometimes is contaminated with so many other things because the filter that is there, we've refused to put it, to use it. When Allah asks you, what did you do? My word, I sent it to you and I gave you a life of 70 whole years. In 70 years, you could not make the effort to learn my word to you. It would have taken you five years out of 70 to study that properly, correctly, thoroughly. You didn't even do that much. What answer do you want to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is why my brothers and sisters, let us aim very, very high and let us understand it is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has shaitan working on us in order for us to be able to achieve a greater reward. Some people ask, well, why did Allah create the devil? And why does the devil, you know, lead us astray, try to deviate us? That is because you will achieve a reward by simply understanding. This is coming from the devil. I stay away from it. Just staying away from it. You've already achieved the reward. That's the plan of Allah. So this is why it's not only engaging in good deeds, but it's also abstaining from prohibitions. Shaitan will come and beautify things. The Quran says that. Shaitan will beautify for you so many things. It's up to you to be strong. It's up to you to be able to restrain yourself. And it's up to you to be strong enough to fulfill the command of Allah when shaitan is making you lazy, laziness. A lot of us and wallahi, a lot of us, myself included, we can do much, much, much better when it comes to recitation of the Quran on a daily basis. Don't you agree? There we are. I can do better as well. The amount we read, sometimes we haven't read and the day has passed. How dare you? Who gave you this day? It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You mean you didn't pick up his book and read one verse, two verses? You didn't? How dare you? May Allah forgive us all. Pick up the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First thing in the morning, open it out. Read at least a page. This is for those who aspire for Jannah. You want paradise. Do not divorce yourself from the word of Allah because that would mean you're divorcing yourself from your own aspirations. The word of Allah. And it doesn't stop only at reading or reciting the Arabic. You need to now go into the English. Look at it. Go into your language. Look at it. See it. Study it. Ask questions. Ask those who know to interpret it for you. Get the various interpretations. Compare it. Understand it. Go to those whom you trust. Get the knowledge from them. See what they're saying. Purify your knowledge always. Shaitan used a plan with the Christians. He used the same plan with the Muslims. The plan was not to worship Allah, to worship everyone and anyone besides Allah. That's what Allah says in the Quran. But you haven't yet read the Quran, so you don't even know what's the plan of the devil. Imagine. If I were to tell you, listen, there are robbers who are coming to your business. They are going to scale the wall. They will deactivate the alarms. They will come in from the north and they will actually break the window in this way. They will, have, they will come in and they are planning this and this and this. And I give you the book and I say, listen, if you want to save your business, read this book. You wait, you haven't read it. Nothing has happened and you complain, hey, thieves came. And then I tell you, listen, didn't I give you a book to tell you the thieves would come and how they would steal? You say, oh, was that the book? 
That's what we are doing with the Quran. Allah is telling you there is a devil. He's, he, this is what he will do. He will come. He will rob your Iman. He will rob your Akhirah. He will rob your Jannah, which is your aspiration. He wants to take it away from you. And this is how he will do it. He will come this direction. He will make you think. He will make you that. And this is how you will protect yourself from him. But we've never read the book. A man dies and then Allah asks him, but didn't I send you the book? He says, oh, was that what the book was all about? Okay, okay, okay. Send me back. Let me go and now do it. That's what the Quran says. And Allah says, too late. Too late. My brothers and sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us direction. To make us strong. To make us from people who aspire for Jannah. And these petty items, yes, we might want to achieve a few things. It's not wrong to have the latest phone. I perhaps do have quite a phone that's quite latest, mashallah. <laughs> it's not wrong to have the latest, but it's wrong to run after it in a way that you miss your main objective. It's wrong to run after it in a way that you miss your main objective. You miss what you're aiming for. What's the, what's the point of having everything you want, but you don't have a link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It can never bring about contentment. If you have Allah, you will always have contentment even if you have nothing in terms of material items of the world. And if you have all the material items of the world but you don't have Allah, you will never be able to achieve contentment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us contentment. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahu bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.